He'd probably take one look at me and beat me with a bamboo stick and then ask for a foot massage or something. I'm not going to partake in that, but I can appreciate his clothes as he's, you know, beating me with a bamboo stick. Hi friends, and welcome to my chaotic corner of the internet where we sit down, caffeinate, and chat about fashion history and other things, mostly other things. Today's style is an aesthetic that I have been enamored with ever since I was a little child. And once you know what that aesthetic is, you will think that's a very strange thing for a little child to be enamored with. Then again, I was a very strange child. So without further ado, because we have a lot of ground to cover, we have a lot of tangents, to hop on and we have a lot of rabbit holes to dive into. I present to you Adventure Style. I call it Adventure Style. Some may also call it Adventure Pulp after the serialized pulp novels of the 30s and 40s. Some may call it the Victorian Explorer Style. Some may also call it Imperialism Style, which is a little controversial. Not a little a lot controversial. Adventure style is a broad category. For me, it represents Indiana Jones, Steve Irwin, Zookeeper Gamekeeper, Amelia Earhart, and Charles Lindbergh, the pioneer age of aviation in the 20s and 30s. It also encompasses the Victorian explorer during the golden age of English Victorian exploration, the colonialism style. Adventure style is a style that I have never partook in, but I had aspirations ever since the first moment I watched Raiders of the Lost Ark syndicated on TV, I wanted to partake. But the cruel irony is I've never partook, but I wanted to partake. And why didn't I partake in it? I think when Banana Republic was at the height of their explorer safari look, I was 10 years old, so that was not a store for me. And then I started to see some gentlemen in fedoras walking around. I would see a few comic book store guys walk around in fedoras and and they kind of killed that Indiana Jones look. So let's kick up our feet and get comfortable because I've got a long story for you. It's like you're visiting grandma's house and she's got memories. And do I have memories? We take you back, it was the 1800s. Queen Victoria was on the throne. Every nobleman, every third son of a noble wanted to be an explorer. It was considered a great honor to set forth and colonize other nations for the queen, for the country, for the queen and country. And it was an age when you can just say, I wanna be an explorer. That was an actual occupation available to, um, to aristocrats. It wasn't available to the poor. They had to work in, in the factories. They had to spend 16 hours a day shoveling coal into steam engines, but their richer counterparts, usually the second son of an earl or the second son of a duke, maybe the third son, because the first son inherited the land because of primogeniture, but the third son, the second son, they had to find something to do with their lives. So they either bought a commission in the army, in the navy, actually mostly in the, in the navy because that gets you going places, and they sailed to the vast reaches of the British Empire. The British Empire had it going on. They were expanding, going to Africa and taking it for themselves, going to the West Indies. It's mine, obviously, America. They took some of that too. They lost some of it, but they don't want to acknowledge that. China, they wanted a piece of that too. India, they got that. Australia, it's theirs. As the saying goes, the sun never sets on the British Empire. It's kind of like nowadays where you can literally break into somebody's house and say that you live there. If you set foot in Egypt or you set foot in India and then you plant your British flag on the soil, it's yours. I don't understand how that works, but they made it work and boy, did they ever. A lot of people were explorers. That was an actual job back in the day. You list on your resume. I. I am an explorer, and then you were. And then you went out with your binoculars and your knee length shorts and your high woolen socks, your pith helmet, and you saw, and then you came and you conquered. And if there were any natives out there that said, no, this land is my land, it's not your land, you would say, I think not, it is my land. And it would be, because you can. Why could you? They met with some resistance, but they quickly, they quickly squashed that resistance. They basically were so proud of being being British that everybody else had to be British too. And if you didn't, there will be consequences. 
there will be dire consequences for saying no to the Brits. That was colonialism. That was imperialism. That's where we get our fashion. That is a disclaimer that it comes with um, with a dark history. But then again, if you were to dig deep into anything in the world, it all comes with a dark history. So if you let that deter you from enjoying the aesthetic, why not just let that deter you from enjoying anything in life? If there's one thing I've learned from my studies of mankind throughout the dawn of time, men and women have always been horrible individuals and that's just the nihilist speaking in me. No one has ever really been that truly excellent to each other. That's why Bill and Ted said be excellent to each other and nobody has learned. Mankind, we suck. Everybody sucks. We all suck. There's no hope for us. The only thing we have going for us are our clothes. That's why I'm here to appreciate the clothes and heckle the man. And even though I enjoy the look of the Victorian explorer slash colonist, I don't want to go back in time and be colonized. I don't want to go back to China and have some British guy feed me some opium so they could take over my land. No. Or do I want to time travel to the seedy underbelly of Whitechapel so I could run my own opium den as Madam Jade or whatever? No. No, I don't. Actually, that doesn't sound too bad. I don't mind running my own den of sin. Do I want to keep company and rub elbows with a Victorian explorer man? No. No, I don't at all. He'd probably take one look at me and beat me with a bamboo stick and then ask for a foot massage or something. I'm not going to partake in that. But I can appreciate his clothes as he's, you know, beating me with a bamboo stick. Let's begin with a quick rundown of some famed Victorian explorers. We have the most famous one, Dr. Livingston, of the famed Dr. Livingston, I presume. His name is David. He was an explorer and a missionary. His ambition is to discover the sources of the Nile. I feel like it's not hard to discover the sources of the Nile. I mean, it's like there, you just follow the river down to the source. I'm ventured to say it's not hard to find the source of a very big river, but he was the first to do it. And in the interim, he got lost and he was discovered by Henry Morton Stanley. And that was where we get the famous line, Dr. Livingston, I presume. And the third explorer whom I have a special connection with. I didn't know him personally, though I heard through the grapevine that he was a, he was an Orientalist. His name was Sir Richard Francis Burton. He explored everything, everywhere, everyone. Where didn't he go? He went to Africa, he went to Asia. That's why he was an Orientalist. And he went to the Americas and he was kind of like an anthropologist. He studied people, he wrote about them, and he participated in their tribal ceremonies. And he slept with like a lot of women in every country. So he got around. He was like the most interesting man. He also went undercover in a male brothel and partook in activities in said brothel. He came close to being discovered one night when he lifted his robe to urinate. He had like one hell of a Victorian mustache. It was bushy, like Tom Selleck-esque. The reason why I have a special connection to him was because the first romance novel I've ever read at the age of 13 was called The Duchess by Jude Devereux. The hero in this romance novel was not so secretly based off Sir Richard Francis Burton. He was like 33 and he was suffering from malaria. As a 13 year old, I was, I was horrified that the heroine, a 19-year-old American heiress from the Gilded Age, would ever consider a romance with a 33-year-old man with a mustache. He was a prolific writer. He spoke like 25 languages. He had a life of adventure and daring. I think he was in the Navy. Yeah, I think you had to be in the Navy to get around, okay? He was in the Navy. He had like a commission. He was the second son of a duke. He was a learned man. He was an adventurer. He he had like all these knife scars all over his body. He had like a 
chest full of hair. Oh, it was so disgusting. This book stuck in my mind so deeply and I read it several times during high school. I typed it up into AOL, June Deverell, the Duchess, and I found a Amazon review and somebody said he was based off this real life character, Sir Richard Francis Burton. I put in my Encarta Encyclopedia CD-ROM and I looked up Sir Richard Francis Burton and I saw his face. My little eyes went straight to that mustache and was still equally horrified. But then when the internet got better and I was on Ask Jeeves, I typed up Sir Richard Francis Burton. And mind you, I was like 17 years old and in college looking up this Victorian explorer. I discovered in 1991, they made a movie about him. This movie, it was called Mountains of the Moon and it starred Patrick Bergen. But I got his name right, Patrick Bergen. He was in sleeping with the enemy with Julia Roberts. He was the enemy. He was her abusive husband. In this movie, he played Sir Richard Francis Burton, the explorer, and Lord Friendzone Ian Glenn played his friend turned adversary, John Hanning Speak. What was Lord Friendzone's name in Game of Thrones? Somebody tell me right now, Sir Jorah. He played Sir Jorah, Lord Friendzone in Game of Thrones. And Richard Burton's wife was played by Aunt Petunia of Harry Potter fame. Aunt Petunia had a nude scene. The more you know, right? This movie had a great tagline and a great premise. Two strangers made friends by a savage land. Two friends made enemies by the civilized world. <sighs> Isn't that like just the most amazing copywriting you ever read, two strangers brought together on a daring adventure through Africa to try to find the source of Victoria Falls, and then they were torn apart by the civilized world. Oh, that's so promising, so much room for great characterization with a great adventure. But let me tell you guys, this movie was disappointing. It was not as exciting as the back of the DVD and the tagline would have you believe. I was expecting a Raiders of the Lost Ark, romancing the stone kind of deal. But what I got was a very slow paced movie. The acting was fine, the characterization was fine. Lord Friendzone, Ian Glenn, he was still Lord Friendzone in this movie because he totally had a thing for Richard Burton, but it wasn't reciprocated. He's completely typecast in every role he plays as the guy who yearns for the love of his life who can never be. But he did make his feelings known when Richard Burton had malaria and then he was kind of like out like a light and then he like kissed him secretly. This is the basic building blocks of the adventure style wardrobe. It's founded on function and utility. I think function and utility means the same thing. Comfort and utility. It's a very classic style, but you can go overboard. The blueprints of these outfits are very military inspired. We're talking pilots, the Air Force. We don't have a very tight clothing. You don't want spandex. There's no spandex. There's no skinny jeans. For women's wear, your pants are loose ranging anywhere from wide-legged palazzo pants, it's my favorite word, palazzo pants, to maybe a straight trouser, but in any event, we don't want clingy fabrics. And speaking of fabrics, we want natural fabrics, cotton, linen. Linen is huge because if you're adventuring in Cairo, you want breathable fabric, and linen is one of the most breathable fabrics on earth. And cotton twill, not just cotton, cotton twill. It's a sturdier weave, it's kind of like the same material Material that you would have if you were Rosie the Riveter in your panic jumpsuit. If you were in any way, shape, or form wearing the 2011 Millennial Minimalist wardrobe, then you would have probably owned a military jacket, a, a light military jacket, and a striped shirt, and you would wear it together with your skinny jeans and your ankle boots. That's the 2011 Millennial look. That's probably the material that your jacket was made of, not just cotton, not the cotton of your shirts, but cotton twill, it's sturdier so that you can 
be active, Indiana Jones active, and not tear your clothing. If you were venturing in a colder climate, let's say you're Shackleton exploring the Antarctic, you want wool, you want a nice wool Icelandic sweater. Everywhere you go, you have leather, leather satchel, leather jacket. Leather is very warm. So I don't know why Indiana Jones wore leather while he was in Egypt but the desert gets cold at night. You take it off during the day, you put it on at night. Of course, since this style harkens back to the 1800s, to the 30s, to the 40s, we don't have synthetic materials. We don't have polyester. So everything you own in your adventure capsule wardrobe, and it is a capsule wardrobe, mind you, because you're traveling. You gotta save room for all the artifacts you're going to. Um, steel. Military details made up the foundation of what some of these clothing items were based off of. Indiana Jones's jacket was based off a World War II pilot jacket. So get yourself one of those. Get yourself a bomber jacket to complete this wardrobe. Utility is the name of the game. We want everything to be functional. We want everything to be rugged. We want leather. We want a sturdy canvas. Extra points if you have a bag made out of sailing canvas would not be something. Olives, browns, ivory, very subdued earth tones. Khaki, the khaki shirt. You want a nice khaki camp shirt with those two pockets right here. You want to look like Steve Irwin. You want to bring forth that Muldoon vibe from Jurassic Park. You are a zoo keeper. You are a game hunter. You're out there on that safari khaki head to toe back in the Victorian ages. You will see those lieutenants, those viceroys. They would come to the jungles and then they would wear khaki, head to toe khaki and shorts. And as I said before, none of your clothing items were tight. And if you would notice, those officers wore very big baggy shorts. These are basically the 90s boy shorts. I take that back because 90s boy shorts went down a lot farther. They went down like mid calf, but these cut off right at the knees. And then you would have the high wool socks to, to keep your calves firm. <laughs> I think they're compression socks in many ways. You would wear a nice boot, maybe a Clark's Desert boot. I own a Clark's Desert boot, not by Clark's, but by Franco Sarto. They're not that comfortable, but they are stylish. If you were a British officer in the Victorian age, you would have a pith helmet to keep the sun away from your fair British skin. Obviously, you want some sunglasses. You're out adventuring, so a nice pair of aviators would do perfectly, but you know what would look awesome with this outfit? If you had those motorcycle sunglasses with the side shield, very steampunkian, and with your sunglasses and your khaki camp shirt, a colorful tie, maybe like mustard yellow, that's a look. That's kind of like a director look. I'm actually painting a picture of a 70s director here. Let me guide you into the world of men's adventure shorts. We have Ray Fines, or is it Rafe Fines from The English Patient. He spent most of this movie in shorts. Okay, so The English Patient, one of my favorite movies, but my husband's most hated movie. He thinks it's incredibly boring, but I'm here for the clothes. Remember that episode of Seinfeld where Elaine, she hates The English Patient, but Jay Peterman and I, we love The English Patient. It checks off every single box of the adventure style. Ray Fiennes, billowy white shirt, billowy blue shirt with baggy breathable shirt shorts and little socks, crew socks. This movie had Kristen Scott Thomas in the best wardrobe ever. She also partook in shorts, her khaki shorts, billowy white shirt. The white button down is like a staple in a lot of aesthetics, but no aesthetic features it more prominently than the adventure aesthetic. If you have a white button down shirt, you're halfway there. You're halfway there to being Kristen Scott Thomas, who is my, my goals. She's a very sophisticated, elegant lady and she's very sexy too. I see her as somebody who would wear a slim bodycon dress with stockings that contain that seam down the back and very high four inch pumps and then she would step on your face with her pumps. That's the type of vibe she gives out and that's my goals. I don't think I give out the vibe where I step on your face with my four inch pumps but I may step on your face with my Clark desert boots. You know 
One of the hobbies one must do as an adventurer is whatever Ray Fiennes was doing in this movie, which is carry a battered copy of Herodotus, the histories, write your little notes, your little inklings all over margins of the pages. He could just be scribbling nonsense. Who knows? Also, draw your little sketches inside the margins of this ancient text so that years later, somebody else can find it. Aviation is also a huge part of this aesthetic. If you are not a private pilot, then then I don't know what to tell you. Get out of the room. Because Amelia Earhart was quite the fashion icon of her day and today. She's very tall, she's very statuesque. She actually really looks like Kate Blanchett, who I think played her in a movie. I didn't see this movie. During her time, she had her own fashion line. And what wouldn't I give to get my hands on Amelia's clothes, Amelia's labels? The lady aviatrix. She's got the leather jackets, the crisp button down white shirt. She's got the loose fitting trousers, but are also tailored to her body. And she's got the pilot hat, the pilot hat with the ear flaps. You can wear one of those. You don't have to be a pilot. People might wonder about you, but it sure beats wearing a fedora nowadays, doesn't it? Grandma Teresa would like to recollect about the programs she watched back in the days where things were a little quieter and she was a lot younger. Her recollections of the adventure style. Between 2001 and 2002, there was a Vogue photo shoot of Kira Knightley during her Bend It Like Beckham period. She hasn't played Lizzie Bennett in Pride and Prejudice. 2005 yet. It was like a safari adventure style photo shoot. I am not even looking at these images right now because they were so ingrained in my mind. I love this photo shoot so much. I ripped the pages out from Vogue and I, I put in my scrapbook. So the theme of this photo shoot was that Kara Knightley was a woman of the world, kind of a Hemingway-esque Isaac Dennison type of writer. Uh, she lands in Africa and she's wearing couture ball gown with ruffled skirts. She's in a tent and she has her typewriter and she's wearing a white 1910s lacy laundress. This is what I think about when I think about impractical adventure style, couture adventure style, where you dress in evening wear to go out to the safari. This is like what I imagined my life would be, that when I grow up, I would be a writer, number one, and I would be successful enough as a writer to travel the world and write my novels on a typewriter, basically the whole Hemingway life, the whole Isaac Dennison life. By the way, Isaac Dennison is a Danish writer and she wrote Winter's Tales and Out of Africa. I don't know if the book itself was called Out of Africa or it was part of her short story collection. Out of Africa starring Meryl Streep and Robert Redford was based on her experience. She owned a coffee plantation in Kenya. I think the movie won Best Picture or somebody won. Meryl Streep probably won something. That's the whole vibe, this vote photo shoot was aiming for. And because of this photo shoot, I wanted to be a writer who looked fabulous, who would who would travel around with her typewriter. So that's why I have this typewriter. I did become a writer. So I figured I'd be selling my short stories to the New Yorker, to Esquire, what have you, wherever they take short stories. And I would get like $50,000 per short story. But obviously that's, that's not true. Maybe they did pay writers a lot more back in the 20s or 30s in in relation to the standard of living. Maybe it didn't cost that much to live better back then, but Hemingway sure lived well. Hemingway was kind of like an influencer. Did I become a successful literary novelist? Did I win a Pulitzer Prize? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Let's talk about Jurassic Park. Now we're going into gamekeeper, game hunter, zookeeper territory. We can talk about Dr. Alan Grant and his blue camp shirt and his little red scarf. We can talk about how the gold bloom was kind of dressed inappropriately because he was kind of dressed in all black again. He was just hot, it was unbreathable. I think he had a leather jacket. He's hot in a variety of ways. <laughs> 
but he was mostly hot because he wasn't dressed for the setting for the Costa Rican climate. And that's why he had to unbutton his shirt and get into the iconic lounge position, as you see in the meme, because of the lack of breathability. Let's talk about the lawyer. He's the lawyer who got eaten by the T-Rex. He adopted the um, British officer, the British colonist way of dressing where you are still at work, you're still performing your duties, but it's hot so you wear shorts. So he's still a lawyer. He's still got his suit and tie, but he's got his shorts on and his little socks. Then we have Modoon, the game hunter, Modoon, whom I thought his name was Mo Digley. I heard somebody call him Mo Digley in the movie and it stuck and forever and always he would be called Mo Digley until somebody informed me that his name was Mo Dune. So now I feel like a total bonehead. He's got the full zookeeper outfit, the full Australian, I wanna say drover outfit, but what do I know what drovers wear? He's got his shorts. I hope he has a license for those shorts because they are pretty short and I hope he sits like a proper gentleman. I hope he's got his situation under control because there's children on this island and there are there are dinosaurs on the loose and popping your balls out for either one of them would be very bad. The shorts. Why are they so short? Ever since men started wearing shorts in like the 50s through the 80s, they have been super short and his shorts were super short. He's got like very muscular thighs, like a fine cut of thigh Mo Digley has. And um, well, he died in the movie, so that sucks. And I really hope that Raptor didn't feast on his balls because that's the best part of Mo Digley Mo Dune. What am I talking about? I don't know how I got here. I don't know how I ended up talking about Mo Digley's balls, but I seem to be very obsessed with, um, with them. I think it's time to end this video because I think it's starting to get a little inappropriate. I would just like to apologize for the fact that I'm talking about Jurassic Park again. Any Gen Zers in my audience, you are probably sick of millennials talking about Jurassic Park. I mean, for millennials, the highlight of our lives was Jurassic Park. All we ever do is talk about how great Jurassic Park is and how great Pulp Fiction is. Some elder millennials like me will talk about how great Raiders of the Lost Ark is and you probably have no idea what we're talking about. And you probably have never even seen Jurassic Park. That's probably what your parents watch or something. So I apologize in advance to the youngins if you're sick to death of Jurassic Park, but you certainly have never heard anybody talk about Mo Digley's balls. I hope that illuminated your life in some way. I'm here to be of service. So that's it. That's it for me. Somebody please get a hook and drag me out of here. So if you like this video, please smash that like button. It will really help me with the algorithm. Leave me a comment down below. Leave me an emoji of shorts if you've made it this far and let me know what you think about the adventure style. Are you at all bothered by its storied past or do you not care? Do you think millennials talk too much about Jurassic Park? or not enough because I can dive deep into Jurassic Park, believe you me. And don't forget to subscribe to ensure that I will see you next time. Goodbye.